Hello, everyone online. What you're missing is uh, fidget toys. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. I'm one of the social and events officers from the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies. Um, I wanted to uh, welcome you all uh, to a joint Staff Pride Network and Disabled Staff Network event and uh, to all the online attendees uh, and future YouTube uh, attendees uh, and those in the room. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're really excited uh, to have uh, Micah here to uh, talk to us about synesthesia and uh, neurodivergence. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, pass you over to uh, Claire Graff to introduce themselves uh, from the Disabled Staff Network. Hello, excellent. Uh, I can be really lazy because Jonathan already gave you my name and my pronouns, so that is super chill for me. Um, I'm one of the chairs of the Disabled Staff Network, and the Disabled Staff Network is open to all staff members who have a disability, self-ID'd, or who are neurodivergent, self-ID'd, also fine. And I've also bought some goodies. Um, which obviously doesn't help anyone online, but if you're in the room, I bought some sunflower lanyards and badges and armbands, and the sunflower scheme basically is a scheme that helps you show that you have a hidden disability, and it helps other people be more respectful and more patient with you um, because they now know that you have a hidden disability. And yeah, if you want one, there's an entire pile there, and if you want one after today, uh, there's an entire pile that sits with me in my office. But there is also, hopefully by now, a pile at uh, all the card services of the university and, to, for example, the library. And some schools even have them. So you should be able to get them there. And I think I'll just stop talking and let the event get on. Well, that's kind of cute. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody for joining in person or online and thank you so much to both the Pride Staff Network and the Disabled Staff Network for having me and just thank you um, on behalf of the synesthesia community for giving synesthesia a stage. So I hope that we can see the slides good enough. Okay, so there were some introductions. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to introduce myself. Thanks again on behalf of the synesthesia community for hosting us today, or hosting me, um, but us as well. Um, this is a talk on synesthesia, neurodiversity, and identity. I'm Maike Breising, she, her, psychologist, synesthesia artist. I'm also uh, the podcast host of the podcast Let's Talk Synesthesia and designer but that's not so important today that's the podcast that's where you can find me on the socials and that's where you can find my psychologist um, persona i guess the neurodiversity support that i provide for late identified late discovered i guess neurodivergent adults um we're gonna talk about neurodiversity synesthesia and identity from a psychologist's perspective, so it will be a lot about mental health and a mental health perspective on synesthesia, which is just not often talked about, I feel like, and I think, hello, I think a uh, big reason for that is that it doesn't impact every synesthete, but we're going to get to that. Okay, so to understand who is joining today and who my audience is, we're going to go back to uh, uh, the Slido for a second. You can either scan the QR code or join on slido.com uh, and just use that thing number. So you should now be able to select and we should be able to see that in, in real time. Well, that's, that's a result. 
<laughs> okay. There we go. Yeah, I guess people might need a bit more time to, to find it. Mum, if you're listening, you're in continental Europe. <laughs> okay, great. I think we can um, leave it at that. This looks like a lot of English native, maybe. We, I can't assume that, but um, it's, I'm not native. I'm German. I might not use the most di difficult English, but I will use a couple niche words. So I hope everybody will be able to understand what I'm saying. Okay, let's move on to the second question. Now, this one is already uh, very deep into the topic. Um, if you don't know what all those words are, just go down and click on I'm not sure, I'm new to the topic. Totally fair <laughs> to, to pick that one. If you do know what the words are, but you don't identify with it, you can go for I consider myself neurotyp neurotypical. Um, and you can also select multiple options. Cool. So how many people do not know what we're talking about? 12%. Cool. <laughs> I love seeing that. <laughs> it's really nice. Okay, so almost 40% have are autistic and have synesthesia. That's good to know. Okay, we're going to move on to the last one, um, which is how much of an expert to, do you consider yourself to be? One would be completely new to the topic and 10 would be an expert. All the friends I info dump on regularly, you can consider yourself to be an expert. <laughs> so, first row, some experts here. Love that. Wow, eight. Eight is a high number. I would probably rate myself as a seven, so let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm very confident, everybody. Um, okay, let's go back to the slides then. And uh, we're going to start with looking at neurodiversity. And we're looking at vocabulary first, because I think that is really, really helpful. Language matters, and we really have to understand what we're talking about here. So I think neurology or neuro is the one that most of us are kind of familiar with, um, the branch of medicine concerned with the nervous system, the brain, um, neuroscience uh, would be the, uh, you know, research branch to, to look into that. Um, neurodiversity, and that's where it gets interesting, and I might need my little cheat sheet here. Uh, neurodiversity is a term that describes basically just the fact that we are all undeniably different in the way we think and process information. Um, and that's just a norm variant of the brain. Like, we don't have the same body height, we don't have the same facial features. There's just a variant. If we, as a human species, all have a brain, the brains will be different. They will not be all the same. And neurodiversity is a term to describe uh, that we are in our neurological makeup and neurocognitive functioning differ from each other. We as a society, us in this group online, we are neurodiverse. That's a term to describe all of us because we have different brains. Even if there are a ton of neurotypical brains in the room, as a group, we are neurodiverse. So that's the word we use for that. Um, neurotype describes... Uh, groups of uh, the same neurological makeup. So you might be of the neurotype synesthesia <laughs> because you have synesthesia. So that's just another word to use that. Neurotypical refers to the majority of our species. Um, so the dominant societal, su suicidal, su societal norm. Um, uh, so neurotypical would be the opposite to neurodivergent. 
Now, neurodivergent, I identify as neurodivergent because I have multiple um, neurodivergent, well, I'm part of neurotypes that aren't neurotypical. Um, yeah, does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, right, a neurominority, I think it, it makes sense by now. Neurominority, all those that are not neurotypical, having synesthesia means you are part of a neurominority um, because it's only like four to five percent of the population. Uh, and to use that in a sentence, like I said before, we as a species are neurodiverse and I am and many uh, joining today are part of a neurominority and uh, therefore neurodivergent. Okay, neurodiversity is a umbrella term for a bunch of different conditions, including autism, ADHD, ADD, synesthesia, and a bunch of others. And the list is kind of endless, which means a lot of people are neurodivergent and also have combined um, neurodivergent um, makeup. So uh, today we're going to look at especially synesthesia, but we're also going to touch on autism and ADHD. The other ones we're not going to cover today because that would just take ages. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about that. Autism. Um, so a lot of my clients, the clients I work with, are both autistic and have synesthesia. And that's why it is very important for me to speak about autism and how autism affects your day to day and how it is so misunderstood. And I think that's the, it's probably the part that I'm most passionate about and that I want to explain. I really want to bring that across that autism as a condition is very, very misunderstood in our society. And it's partly because we didn't um, research it well enough yet. And we looked a lot at what is uh, autism, what does it look like in small boys? Like we all heard that, that autism in, in, in women and girls is very, very under researched, which leads to a lot of misdiagnosis in women and including myself, <laughs> I had uh, a not, not very successful medical history because I wasn't identified as neurodivergent because we just didn't have the, the knowledge and education around it yet. I then went on to study psychology and uh, did a part of psychotherapy training and also still never heard of neurodiversity, not a single time, also didn't hear, hear about synesthesia. So I think there's a lot of work to do to understand this condition better. And if we want to look at the areas of differences, because that's a really important word that we look at them as differences and not as deficits, because the criteria we use in ICD and DSM are very much deficit oriented, um, which do not do autistic people justice. Um, so here are just a couple areas of differences for autistic people. And um, what is also very, very important is that there's a lot of outdated vocabulary when we're looking at autism. So we don't use Asperger's anymore. Um, if you wanna look into that, it's like Nazi times bad namesake. We just don't use that anymore. <laughs> and we also don't use low and high functioning because that's just a very discriminating language. and as I said before, language really, really matters. Um, mild and severe autism, it's the same thing. We don't use that. We don't want to uh, label someone with severe autism. And also being on the, on the spectrum is used way less. I still often hear people say this person is not autistic, but somewhere on the spectrum, which in itself doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Um, and this is a graph that I really like where you can just see autism is not linear. Um, it is a profile of different uh, areas and I'm not say, saying that there aren't any deficits like people experience autism very, very differently um, and might want to 
definitely say they have deficits in some areas. That's completely fair. I just want to emphasize that we look at the topic in a more, this is not a mental health condition, this is a neurodevelopmental condition that leads to a different way of thinking, different way of perceiving the world. Um, and that's totally okay and it's totally normal that we have this variety of um, thinking. Um, and again, it's not linear, it's more like this uh, dynamic pie chart that helps a lot to understand it, uh, in my opinion. Um, and then we're going to look at ADHD before we go on to look at synesthesia. Um, ADHD, it, yeah, I want to start with that because that's really important. For a long time, I think people thought you can be either ADHD or autistic. But that's actually so not the case because they cluster together a lot. And those numbers really show that autism and ADHD, um, a lot of people are what is now called ODHD. So you have AUDHD, which makes the whole experience of being a human <laughs> so much more complicated because ADHD and autism have such contradictory traits. You might look for routine. Um, but then your ADHD loves being flexible and doing spontaneous things, whereas your autism really struggles with that. So there's a lot of people with ADHD do have a rough time. And I think that really needs to be acknowledged. And also we have to um, understand that they most definitely co-occur, most definitely. That's very important. Um, if we look at areas of differences in ADHD, they concern working memory. And um, I think we probably at this point all saw uh, a ton of videos online about, <laughs> I don't know, people um, naming different ADHD symptoms in, in a reel on TikTok and stuff. We spoke about that on the podcast as well. And um, I don't want to go into detail because we started late and uh, I think we have to, <laughs> don't want to uh, take too long on this. Um, but what ADHD comes down to is I, uh, I think we have to call it problem here because it really is a problem in dopamine regulation where due to a um, defective gene, I don't want to say the wrong thing, um, dopamine is either higher or lower and therefore it is difficult for ADHDers to execute tasks that they really want to execute. But due to those um, highs and lows of dopamine, it's really hard to um, do that. Um, so to reflect on that topic, what neurodiversity is, it is a term that describes that we are all different undeniably in the way we think and go about life and it is a global mo movement which is amazing and I think it's such an inspiring movement to be part of. Um, I'm not sure how uh, many of you are on social media but it, online there's a lot of um, content on the neurodiversity movement and one of the very amazing things are this book that I would really highly recommend by Ellie Middleton a guide to neurodivergence that helps so much to understand uh, autism and ADHD is specifically because she translates those diagnostic criteria that we looked at before that are so like in deficit oriented language. Um, she really translated them into day to day uh, experiences and helps a ton young people, but also late discovered adults to really understand themselves, including myself. Um, I think this book is just a big, big recommendation because I think it really uh, puts into words what a lot of people were looking for um, in all those years of misdiagnoses and uh, looking into GP faces that had no idea or getting on the wrong medication. Um, so a lot of us have lived a life of being really 
uh, misunderstood and uh, it's, it's time to uh, yeah, make up for that. Uh, yeah, a very necessary component to understand humankind. I think what we did so far is pretty much look at the physiological side and the psychological side. And I think this third pot on the table of why does someone, for example, behave like this. If you would go to a birthday party, for example, and someone would um, not eat much, not talk much, go to the bathroom a lot maybe, or go, go outside, doesn't um, um, initiate a lot of conversation. I think from like a physiological perspective, you might jump to the conclusion that this person has a stomach issue today. And, from, and that's why they don't eat much and they left early. And from a psychological perspective, you might jump to the conclusion that this person had a lot of experience of being bullied or doesn't feel comfortable in uh, uh, that kind of surrounding or they, you assign some sort of personality traits. But if we just put that third pot of neurodivergence on the table, and I don't want to encourage anybody to jump into assumptions when they observe behavior at all, but what I want to encourage you is to understand that there is a third very important um, base to why we might behave in a certain way and the, the behavior I just described could perfectly fit into the profile of a autistic person. But again, I don't want to encourage you to <laughs> give someone a label or assign a, uh, a condition, obviously, but I think it's very important to just understand um, this is another uh, reason why we might behave differently than uh, society would would expect or yeah what we would expect to see at a party um, yeah what is neurodiversity not um, or neurodivergence uh, it's not an illness it's also not a mental health condition which is often confused um, we're talking about neurodevelopmental conditions, so it's not anxiety or, yeah, it's not a mental health condition. I hope that makes sense. And it's also not an excuse, which we see a ton in the media. <laughs> it's a explanation for a lot of people. Um, yeah, we, maybe we can talk about that later, the, how in the media it is so often presented as an excuse or as a trend diagnosis, which really just annoys the heck out of me because I, I don't, uh, yeah, well, maybe let's talk about that later, <laughs> but that's a big one. Okay, let's move on to synesthesia. Um, we're gonna, first of all, look at vocabulary again, which uh, is probably new to some because synesthesia is not that often talked about yet. Um, synesthesia in the whole neurodiversity movement didn't get a lot of attention yet, uh, which I guess I, I completely understand it, but I just feel like it's my uh, mission to make it seen because it's a very crucial part of a lot of uh, neurodivergent people's uh, experience. And it's really, if you have synesthesia, it can be really like the core of yourself, um, which it is for me. So if we look at the word, it stems from the ancient Greek word syn for together and esthesis for sensation, which uh, adds up to a uh, word that describes merged senses. So we're looking at a brain that merges senses in the widest sense. Um, we can see that here, that's a brain scan where you can see that two areas are activated at the same time. So where the finger is pointing to, um, an example for that is auditory visual synesthesia, for example. So a form that I have is when I hear sounds or voices or whatever, um, music or, or 
melody is playing, not only my, the hearing part of my brain will be activated, like for most people, but my brain will have this double reaction of also the visual part being activated. So it's very, um, on an FM, fMRI, it's very visible that this is not imagination or anything. People uh, try to um, make synesthetes believe that it's not real, but we can, we can definitely see it on a brain scan and also have a lot of test batteries to see what synesthesia actually is. So we're talking about a double reaction and in some cases even a triple reaction. We had one person on the podcast, Maryam, she described that when she smells a sweaty person, she would not only see the smell, which is a common synesthetic experience, you would smell something and also have a visual uh, experience of that smell. But she would also feel the smell on her fingers and her palms. So it's a, like a triple reaction to one stimulus. Uh, that might be hard <laughs> to imagine for those that don't have synesthesia, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's endlessly uh, fascinating to, to think how senses can be merged. A person that has synesthesia or multiple forms of synesthesia is a synesthete or polysynesthete and congenital synesthesia is, describes a synesthesia that you always, like you were born with it because of a genetic disposition. Synesthesia runs in families as well, so it's very common um, to be born with synesthesia. Acquired synesthesia, on the other hand, is not as common, but um, still a very important aspect of synesthesia because I think it's the more terrifying one. Um, acquired synesthesia is um, often starts when someone had a surgery, maybe a brain tumor or some impact on their brain stu structure and the brain needs to recover from that impact and builds new neural connections to uh, um, to recover from that impact so that could mean someone who is like 50 60 years old had a surgery is recovering from that never had experienced synesthesia before but would then wake up um, or maybe not wake up but develop over the next couple of days a sound to color synesthesia and would see colors whenever they um, uh, hear music, which can be really, really terrifying. And I think it's so important to keep that in mind when we talk about synesthesia and mental health, um, because like, I think the first thing everybody would, uh, that would come to mind is like having hallucinations, which again, have a very bad reputation uh, which is also a bit annoying. A lot of people have hallucinations and have are perfectly well and live with hallucinations, like voice hearing, for example. Um, yeah, but I can see how it would be really, really frightening waking or yeah, recovering from a surgery and all of a sudden having those uh, synesthetic experiences. Uh, inducer and concurrent are also two words that are used a lot in synesthesia research where we uh, just describe the stimulus. So for example, the sound or touch or uh, smell as the synesthetic uh, stimulus and then the concurrent is the reaction of our brain to that uh, stimulus, to that inducer. And the last word is projector versus associator synesthete, which is used a ton in synesthesia research. And I guess it makes sense for most people, um, or at least to research it. But I think it's a bit of a tricky one for me, at least. Projector synesthete would be if you have a smell to visual synesthesia, for example, and you uh, see let's say you're driving a car and you smell something from outside or someone's eating in the car. And as a projector synesthete, you would see those uh, colors, shapes and forms um, in front of you and they would even block your vision, possibly. 
Um, so they would impact your ability to drive even because you see it out in the world. Whereas an associator synesthete would see it in their mind's eye or would just know, like some people, they just know that that key on the piano, if you play it, it's blue, uh, but they don't see the color anywhere, which is fascinating to me. <laughs> I can't <laughs> imagine that, that you just know, but you don't have any visual representation of that sound. Um, so to describe where I see it, I would say there is like an extension of my body and brain that is like somewhere here. It's like an inner screen and infinite space. <laughs> and when I uh, hear someone speak, for example, I see the words written out in colors. And like that's called ticker tape synesthesia. So I would see constant subtitles to what people say and what I say. Um, if I would hear a song with lyrics, for example, I would see the lyrics written out in color, but I would also see the melody and the instruments playing in that infinite space as well. Um, so uh, that's kind of where it is for me, but for other people, again, it might block even their vision or it's just an association that they don't see at all. Okay, so since synesthesia is the most um, artsy neurodivergence of them all. I'm going to give you a couple of examples on how uh, uh, I transform my synesthesia experience into visual or digital art. Um, but also to just give you examples of what it uh, might look like. So this is uh, the voice of a friend. I asked her if she could speak the intro of my podcast and then she said uh, she doesn't like her voice at all and then this uh, because she said that because she judged her voice it became so clear and I had to make a design out of it um, because she had a beautiful purple voice and you can see I hope you can see but um, it's dynamic and it has different textures and colors and layers and then this is the alphabet this describes another form called grapheme color synesthesia, which I think is very common, um, that letters and numbers have colors assigned. I think the most common one, though, is words or month of the year having colors assigned. Maybe you can dig in your brain. If you think about March or Wednesday, maybe there is a color association for you as well. Um, I on purpose didn't put like colored letters on it because I know that pisses off a lot of synesthetes when they have to look at the wrong color letters. So this is a abstract version of the alphabet. Um, and then the third one, which apparently doesn't have, there we go, pain. Um, earlier this year I got a piercing. It's this one, and I uh, really, really wanted to make <laughs> art about it. So I really paid attention, uh, went there, closed my eyes, and just watched the needle go through my the skin of my nose uh, to come up with this, because I think it's a good day-to-day -day example, because it's also one of, it's not a harmful pain. like. Um, but stuff like that would happen if I have period cramps, if I would, uh, knock my head against something, uh, anything really, even just touch and tactile experiences are, it feels like every sensation has to go through this part of my system. It has to pass this. Uh, in order to be processed and understood by me, It ha the information has to pass this area of my system. Okay, so those are forms that I have. Um, I made this graphic a while ago and I think um, it it shows the endless combinations of senses that we can connect. I'll just give you a couple seconds. Can you even see it? Okay. So 
a very, very common one as well is personifications, which is a bit different and might be confusing at first because we're talking so much about prop like actual senses, like uh, touch, smell, um, uh, taste. But personification is just as important because it's it's one that also impacts children a lot if they have what is called OLP, Ordinal Linguistic Personification, where numbers have uh, colors and personifications assigned. So kids might not want to interact with the number seven because the number seven is a bully and that that will be very, very misunderstood by a teacher. Obviously, because you, if you don't have any education around it, you might think that kid just wants to be difficult or has a lot of fantasy. Whereas when you have those really strong uh, social connections for numbers and letters, it really impacts a kid's uh, perception of school and homework and everything. Um, yeah, so personification is another uh, important form. And we also did a podcast episode about that. <laughs> so if you, if you have a suspicion that you might have that form, you maybe want to look into that a bit more. Okay, so there are a couple forms that we will look at a bit closer because I asked a couple clients and podcast guests if I could present their story to make the point of why it is so important for mental health. So we're going to get back to those forms in a bit. Now, what synesthesia is and what synesthesia isn't. Um, does anybody want to give a guess? I feel like I've, sp I've been speaking for a while now. <laughs> Maybe anybody in, in the room. What, what is synesthesia and what is it not? Very good. It's a neurodivergence. Very good. I think it's Look, it's the first one on the list. Um, yeah, it's what I like to call a double reaction of the brain. I'm not sure if that is a, a medical valid term, um, but it can even be a triple reaction. Yeah, it runs in families. My dad has synesthesia, his sister as well. So uh, even though it can be acquired or not found in families, the majority of us has a family member that has synesthesia as well. Very interesting though, only the disposition to have synesthesia is um, genetically uh, inherited, but uh, not the form. Like you might have a completely different form than your family members, which I think is also very fascinating to, to think. Um, and it makes fantastic art and it's fun and synesthesia is just a great thing to have. Um, what is it not? It's not a disorder, not an illness, nothing to cure. Uh, it's not a mental health condition, again. It's also not thinking in metaphors. And I think it's, even though a lot of us have hyperphantasia, it's not the same thing. Like it's, um, yeah, it's just not having a lot of fantasy. It's not thinking in, oh yeah, that sounds about right. Like. Uh, yeah, Wednesday could be, I could imagine Wednesday to be to be yellow or anything. It really is set in stone and very, very consistent over time. So when I was eight and my mom asked me to sit down to write down the alphabet and every uh, color for the letters, they are still the very same colors today and I think they will be in 40 years because I really can't imagine anything else even if I try to imagine a red M, for example, it's like pouring a bucket of paint over a yellow red, a yellow M, but like it will never be red. Do you know what I mean? Like you're just pouring it over and it has this coat on for a second, but it, like it takes a lot of working memory to keep it red. So it's so automated and uh, very hard to imagine anything other than that. Um, yeah, so we're gonna look at mental health and synesthesia now. Um, 
I think it's kind of jumping over slides a bit. Sorry for that. I don't know why it deletes some stuff. Magic. Yeah, magic. <laughs> well, good. That is the slide I wanted to show you. So uh, my personal experience of living a very misunderstood life, a life of misdiagnosis, uh, like I said, a life of GP faces that didn't know what else to do with me other than give me an allergy test and then another allergy test and think I have whatever um, it was just on like restrict, restricted diets and in, it was never clear that what I actually had was synesthesia and autism and knowing that now changes my life completely and I think a lot of the people especially online joining today <laughs> really do understand how only the knowledge and the new guidance and resources online can change your life completely. Uh, I was lucky enough to not get diagnosed with bipolar or um, a personality disorder, but especially bipolar, you're often, they put you on meds that are like not helping at all and you just uh, spiral down in a uh, medical, I don't even know how to call it. it they just, whatever, I, I'm lacking words for this. <laughs> but what I wanted to say is that all of the experience I had, positive and negative, led to me starting uh, a safe space for synesthetes, which is psychological coaching, individual, and I'm going to launch group coaching soon, which is international and virtual for adults, uh, late discovered especially to um, yeah give people exactly that safe space that I would have needed like 10 years ago and 15 years ago and uh, it's it's amazing to provide that uh, with my personal experience that I have today so we have to jump back because there was a mistake mental health and synesthesia if you have it it's you and I think most synesthetes would agree that it's your innate language and that's what I make use of when I see my clients and I think it's also what has the most impact and makes it the most valuable compared to other therapies and other um, support that a lot of synesthetes were seeking out uh, and it's also my experience that therapy did really work but if they don't really speak your language, which often is just colors, shapes, and forms, so I'm not blaming anybody because it is quite a strange thing, but if someone is able to speak that language with you, you can really reach parts of your um, self that you couldn't reach otherwise. Um, so yeah, it's you, it's your perception, it's very much entangled with your mental health and well-being. Um, another reason is there is a lot of misdiagnosis as well. Um, like I spoke about the connection to hallucinations, which, uh, yeah, is another, it's just, I don't want to explain it today, why synesthesia and hallucinations are not the same thing. Um, but neurologically they just aren't. And a lot of kids or they're not kids anymore, but people I meet online, when they speak about their experiences when they were a kid, I often hear that they were told that if they speak about their synesthesia or about, not synesthesia, but whatever they experience, they will send be sent to a uh, psychiatric clinic. And um, so a lot of censoring expected from the synesthetes to not talk about it. Uh, it being belittled or just accused of lying and trying to be fancy and being uh, having a lot of fantasy. Whereas in reality, uh, kids, when they say something like that, most of the time they are just really being honest. And I think we should really respect 
that more in kids. Uh, I think that's another thing that I am just most passionate about, that we don't really take kids seriously enough. I feel like there's a lot of um, kids saying funny things, and then they even have those cute voices and these cute faces, and then we don't really respect what what they say, and especially when it comes to synesthesia, for example, a taste synesthesia, when you hear words and every word has a taste in your mouth, not an association, a proper taste, texture, and temperature. This is a wild thing to have. And if you continuously hear that you're making it up or it's not true and it doesn't exist, or if you talk about it, it will have negative consequences. This really, really impacts a synesthete's mental health. Um, yeah, the, the prevalence for synesthesia in autistic people is much higher than in the general population. Um, and that could also be the case for other neurodivergence. There isn't just a lot of research on it, um, but it, it's quite likely that uh, synesthesia and autism both cluster with a synesthesia but synesthesia in autistic people is roughly three times higher than in a general population which is uh, a significant prevalence for sure okay so this will be the last chapter and maybe the one that is the most um, interesting <laughs> I would say, because uh, like I said, I asked a couple clients and podcast guests if I could share their story um, in making the point why synesthesia and mental health are so entangled and why we have to pay more attention to this. We're going to look at mental health challenges caused by the synesthesia itself, by the coexistence of synesthesia, and how we can improve mental health, existing mental health challenges through synesthesia. Now we have to go through the old slide. Okay. So, as a synesthete that I am, those dots are the people that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so we're going to hear five stories, and we're going to start with mental health challenges caused by synesthesia. The first person, and if you're familiar with my podcast, you might know the story already, but I interviewed Aurora, who is a French filmmaker, and she's based in Canada and has mirror touch synesthesia. Now, that's a form we haven't spoken about yet. Um, it is a form where the self uttered distinction of your mirror neurons is blurry. Meaning if you see someone else being touched or someone else experiencing pain, your mirror neurons will think that you experience this touch or pain in your own body, leading to the experience, even though it's if you see someone being hit, you won't feel the same sensation, but you f will feel a translated to your body, transported um, interpretation of that uh, touch or pain that you are observing. Um, so I think everybody can imagine what that must be like. <laughs> Feeling, well, maybe not imagine, but understand the extent to uh, how this will shape your life, especially as a teenager, everybody's starting to watch horror movies, starting to um, yeah, watch violent scenes. And what Aurora described, which I find very, very uh, powerful, is that she, until she was 35, thought that everybody in the room was a lot stronger than her because she thought everybody of course, feels the pain in their body. That's what she thought. That's what her reality is. And if all her classmates also feel the pain of that person in the TV, then, of course, they must be stronger in handling that pain. Whereas in reality, they just didn't feel the pain. 
and she felt it. So it's very understandable that she would be affected by it physically, emotionally. Um, and that just goes to show that we really need education around, especially mirror touch synesthesia, uh, because I think, <laughs> because um, it, it, it shapes everything in your daily life, like even your partner preferences. Obviously, if you have a partner that would do a lot of risky sports and get home with a cast and a broken nose and a lot of those injuries, which Aurora also experienced, that would mean that this physical pain, because your partner is not taking care of themselves well, would lead to you experience pain on top of your own conditions, on top of your own whatever uh, you're experiencing. So it really, really sh is really important to consider uh, does have someone mirror touch synesthesia when you feel like they are labeling th themselves as maybe being always told they're too sensitive, they have to toughen up, all those labels that are just not true for a mirror touch <laughs> or not for sensitivities in general. Um, this is a uh, form that I think we should all have in mind that this exists and is real. Okay, second very different form is James Warnerton, who I also interviewed on the podcast. He's the UK president of the Synesthesia Association and also the vice president of the International Synesthesia Association. And he's the first ever diagnosed or identified synesthete, which is not that long ago, obviously. Um, he has word to taste synesthesia, which I described earlier, that whenever he hears a word or a sound, he would have a taste in his mouth that would also linger um, my voice, for example, tastes like Victorian sponge cake to him, he told me, uh, which is quite nice, but you, would you want to have the taste of Victorian sponge cake for five hours or a weekend? So again, this really, really uh, influences your partner and relationship choices and friendship choices. Um, and I asked him the other day what his what, how would he describe that this form uh, impacted his mental health? And he said it's the, the biggest impact was that people didn't believe him, which uh, I think until his early 20s, just people didn't believe that it is a thing and uh, were belittling it or I don't know what they uh, actually said to him. But I can imagine that this is really hard because there, like, even if you have to go to school, if you have to take the tube, there's so many tastes every day. And if you're not believed with this very uh, invasive form, it, it only makes you feel more uh, alienated from the world, really. Another thing he said was that you can't escape it, which I think is very, very uh, true as well for a lot of neurodivergent and synesthetic traits. You can't, you, you, it's like, I imagine it to be like having hiccups and you just, it, it lasts for a whole week and you can't escape your body. You just wanna get some sort of control over it, but you can't, it's just there and you don't have any control over it. Um, of course, it's not really like hiccups, but, I think that's just uh, another like experience we all have that we sometimes want to escape, but we can't. Um, yeah, so not having control over it and not being able to flee it, also not being able to have any influence on which uh, taste is good and bad. Like my voice could also taste like hairspray to him and then he would not prefer to talk to me for as much as we do probably. and. All those things really impact how you, um, it can be very limiting as well. Like if you make a good friend and it's, it's not uh, within your possibilities because of your 
synesthesia. Um, and then that's what I want to mention as well, the somatic responses to this. So if your body constantly thinks that you are eating food because you get um, your brain constantly thinks that you are consuming, it will pump acid, stomach acid to your to your stomach, which will lead to cramps and just an overall very tricky relationship with food. Um, okay. The second perspective, which is mental health challenges caused by the coexistence, which um, I picked myself because that's what I can talk about most um, easiest, I guess. So like I said before, I'm autistic and I have synesthesia, meaning that I already have a ton of sensitivities to sound, smell, touch, um, most things really, <laughs> heat, um, brightness of the sun. And if all of those sensories uh, stimuli are also translated into a color, like I said before, they all have to pass this uh, space in my system where they are translated into a color. What I end up in a day is just double the amount of stimuli to process. Um, which, and that's what most people or most synesthetes say, I wouldn't trade it for anything, but there's just a huge but <laughs> because you really um, have to be aware of it. You have to know um, which capacity you have, which resources you have, and you have to be very, you have to learn to be really kind to yourself because it's not, uh, it's not easy to understand that there are things that you want to do and that most people can do, but you can't, or you have to pay a really, really high price for it. For example, going on holiday, which I did, uh, uh, happened to me twice this year. I went on a really, really nice trip and I was like, okay, this is amazing. There is no sensory overload. I'm, I'm feeling well. And then I come back and I pay for the trip so badly because I'm in full body pain for two to three days because it was way too much and I didn't know. Which then, and I think that plays a lot into like autistic tax, um, I had to cancel all my scheduled appointments because I thought I would be able to work, but I actually wasn't. So that means I either have to uh, have days off after a holiday that will be overstimulating or I have to come back from a holiday earlier than my friends to have that time to recover. Which is all, I guess, okay once you came to that point of realization and understand yourself and know how to work around it or with it. Um, but it's a long way, I can tell you. It's not, <laughs> it's not easy to get there. And the last perspective on mental health is how can we improve one's already existing mental health challenges by using synesthesia? Um, and I have two examples, one from a client and one from a podcast guest that I equally love. I think they're mind blowing. So Gemma is a client of mine, that's not her real name. And she has emotion to color synesthesia, meaning emotions she perceives and feels herself will be um, um, translated into a color, shape, and texture in her body. So there are chest feelings and stomach feelings. Uh, the stomach feelings are more liquid, more um, dynamic, and the chest feelings are more intense, more negative, darker, um, more greasy, oily, like they're while the stomach feelings are very splashy, like if she has, if she feels something, if she's really happy, that emotion would splash into her whole body in colors. Um, whereas the chest feelings are very uh, much darker and more greasy. And a third category is feelings that are in the chest, but on top of that are spiky. So if she imagines or thinks about those feelings, feels those feelings, she automatically sees them as spiky. 
and which is really interesting for me in a psychological practice working with her is that those spiky feelings you can't you can't touch them yet you, they are unprocessed but you also can't approach them yet they're approachable yet so s seeing in the process of coaching that an emotion or a situation leading to experiencing a spiky feeling would slowly transition into a chest or stomach feeling that is approachable is a very beautiful um, visualization of the process that we do in the work. Um, I hope that was understandable and I hope my client <laughs> agrees to what I just described. Um, and the last story is Hari, another podcast guest, and he is autistic and has synesthesia. And I think that story as well is absolutely mind blowing. He has auditory visual synesthesia, meaning sounds are translated to color. And his, due to his autistic traits, he uh, has difficulties here when someone would say, I have news for you, he, find it, he finds it really difficult to understand whether that person is giving him good or bad news. Are they angry? Are they happy? That's something he always found really, really difficult to detect and then also didn't know how to react and was often um, called rude and um, not empathetic enough because he couldn't react uh, appropriately to our societal standards to what the person said. He then realized much later in his life that due to his auditory synesthesia, what they say will have a color anyway. So the, the sentence, I have news for you, for example, would be read, but then depending on the saturation level of that sentence, he could understand whether that person was happy or angry. I hope that makes sense. So, and that's what I mean by learning your own innate language. It, it's there, <laughs> and I think, I think especially because we know that uh, synesthesia is so much higher in autistic people, it's really important to understand those connections and see the potential of it. Um, and it's not about pleasing other people, but also Harry said, since he realized that he never got any complaints from, from his friends anymore, <laughs> which is, uh, good f for his own mental health and his sense of belonging in a in a friend group i guess okay so here are a couple takeaways from today's talk i want you to remember that ne the neurodiversity movement changes people's lives like it did mine and it certainly also saves people's lives neurodivergent traits are Differences, not deficits, and language matters, which could just be up there. Uh, it really does, and that doesn't mean they can't be disabling, um, but we want to look at them in a more holistic, uh, empathetic, and kind way. Um, autism and ADHD aren't a trend, uh, and we have let people down, which is also a very important point from my point of view and I guess every neurodivergent person ever. <laughs> uh, synesthesia is an important part of the neurodiversity rainbow and if you have it I really want, you want to encourage you to uh, look into it because I think there is a lot of potential once you tapped into your synesthesia. Um, yeah and the other point I already made we need to listen and respect children and in that case children that have synesthesia it won't go away so we might as well respect it understand it and work with it uh, yeah that's it if you want to reach out for the podcast for anything um, uh, re regarding my psychological support you can find me with just my name and dot com and that's it from me long long monologue thank you Just to say thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'd probably be interested to hear from other people 
Uh, I'll be interested to hear from other people in here, maybe, or online. Uh, but we'll go to Q&A just now. I think there's a question from the uh, chat. Yeah, there is um, a question in your Slido, in fact. And okay. the question is, um, right. are there any additional emotional elements associated with the attribution of color to letters, numbers, or words? Um, or is that a different layer of synesthesia? That you was wanna... a long question. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you want to read it from the phone. Yes, OK. Emotional elements associated with the attribution of color. That is a different form of synesthesia, I would say. Um, but you might have graphene color synesthesia and associate emotions with it. Um, but I think you could also associate emotions with a letter without having it being colored. I don't have experience with that, but I think certainly that could be a uh, combination that people experience for sure. Yeah. Um, then I will like ask a question inappropriately as the chair. Um, do you have any research or any numbers on how the uh, form of synesthesia where you don't, where you know it's blue, but you don't see it blue, um, how that corresponds or correlates to people having thoughts without having to verbalize them. So you can have an inner monologue or just process thoughts without verbalizing them. And you can have both and switch back and forth. I'm wondering if the ability to know it's blue without actually seeing blue um, mm -hmm. is has a strong correlation to not having an inner monologue or having the ability to switch it off. Interesting. So uh, I think the, the part of seeing all of those associations is often um, those that also have visual thinking in general. So I think that would be one uh, distinction to make. Are you a visual thinker or not? Um, can you repeat the second part of your question again? So it would be about having an inner monologue or not so you you have different forms of inner monologues right yeah. some people have an inner monologue some people uh have no inner monologue which means they process thoughts and facts and knowledge without assigning words to them and yeah. some people have the ability to switch it on and off and i'm wondering if there's any research um about the correlation between having those wordless thoughts yeah. and having the just knowledge that something is blue without seeing blue mm. because that sounds very normal to me that I know that yeah. certain people are magenta in gender because I don't see gender as most people I see it as a color spectrum so there are people who are magenta I don't see them visually as magenta but they are magenta this is just the thing I know and um, I wonder if this correlates to the not having to verbalize thoughts, but being able to have them separated from an inner monologue. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I think a personal example have really helped me to understand it. Um, I think that would be a fantastic research question. I don't know if it already is being looked at, um, but I think that it makes sense, like the way you described it as well. It, I think it does come down to a to similarities in the way someone would process. So I think if someone, the ability to switch it on and off, first of all, how cool is that? <laughs> but I think those that wouldn't have any inner monologue, it would be um, quite likely or um, logical to think that those people maybe also have more association synesthesia if they have it rather than uh, projecting or, or seeing the color so I see the correlation but I don't know how it is uh, scientifically scientifically backed up right now yet <laughs> more questions yes please uh, my question is sort of is it reciprocal so if a emotion has a color would seeing the color induce the emotion or it, your friend who it, it tastes Victoria sponge 
when he hears your voice, if he needs to respond, does he think of you? Is it sort of, does it go both ways? It doesn't. Very good question. Um, there are cases where it does go in both ways. I would never say it does never. But um, in most cases, it's a one-way thing. So uh, it, also a question I, I get asked a lot is, what is your favorite color then? And what does this color, if this if orange is snoring and you hate snoring, do you dislike orange? Not really, because orange is so many things. So I think, um, yeah, but there is most definitely someone out there that experiences in both directions. It's not very common. Thank you. Got a question from Zo uh, on the Zoom Q and A. So if anyone else is on Zoom and wants to add in a question, pop it on the Q and A, um, please. Is there a connection between high sensitivity HPS and synesthesia? Uh, and how the use of psychedelics would affect the synesthetic brain? That's something I'm wondering too. <laughs> the second part as well, uh, especially how does it affect a synesthetic brain? Okay, so to answer the first question, um, I have a bit of brain fog now. Can you just say the first question again? Yeah, sure. Is there a connection between high sensitivity, right. HPS, Thank you. and synesthesia? Perfect. <laughs> okay, so um, the label being a highly sensitive person, I think, is a good one for many people, but we would today consider it mostly being a stigma free label of autistic traits. Now, that might not be a completely uh, a common way to see it yet, but it pops up more and more um, since years, actually. When I went to therapy, if, to a therapist being specialized in highly sensitive people, and I specifically asked her if there is a chance I could be autistic because I saw the connection online, she said, no, absolutely not, two different things. But I think we're moving closer to that idea that the traits of highly sensitive people and autistic people are very much the same. They're often described in different ways. There are different words used to kind of describe the same thing. Um, so definitely is my answer to that. Uh, because if being highly sensitive is similar to being autistic, it will definitely cluster together, yeah. Thank you. Um, if I may add a comment to that, the answer to the second bit is sort of yes. Um, the first thing you have to know, which unfortunately many medical professionals don't know, is that if you're neurodivergent, most medications that are in some form psychoactive will be different for you. So um, this is why it's really important for um, before you go under, before surgery, that you tell them if you're neurodivergent, because otherwise um, they, you might start waking up. Um, Painkillers, for example, that have um, psychoactive components such as uh, opiates can co work completely different on a neurodivergent brain and they can change your synesthesia. They can, because some of them are relatively likely to cause hallucinations, not hallucination, not delusion, so you know it's a hallucination, you know the thing isn't there, but given that your brain processes that information somewhat differently, um, it, it can completely change it. It can up it to 10, it can make it disappear. It can change it. It can change things from being in color to black and white. It can change the colors that you associate with things, which is very odd. It can enhance your ability to see certain colors attached to words, which normally would be very fade. And so, yes, it definitely can do something to your brain, but it will be likely quite, in a way, individual, simply because if you take psychoactive substances of any form or way, be it prescribed by a doctor or bought from a questionable person behind the pub, the 
the end effect is that it, it does have an effect on your brain's processing. And all humans, if they're neurotypical or neurodivergent, all humans essentially live in virtual reality. This is essentially why you can watch a movie. Um, tra classical movies, when they were still on tape, would be lots of little images following each other. But your brain would be, oh yeah, this is moving, clearly. And your brain would turn this into a movie for you. Your brain would not tell you there are 24 separate pictures. Your brain says there's motion. So that, that is not the reality. The reality are that there are little separate pictures, but your brain hallucinates a movie for you. And this is basically the case with all our senses. So everybody's brain gets impacted by, let's say, LSD or speed or morphine. And um, what, what interesting side effects you experience um, will be quite individual. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Agree. And there will be, hopefully, sometime early next year, a episode on synesthesia and psychedelics, because that's very fascinating. And um, yeah, I guess one aspect could be how do they uh, impact a person that has already does have synesthesia, but the other part is how, um, um, what, what is the synesthetic experience of someone who normally doesn't have synesthesia like on those drugs? How similar is it to a synesthete's experience? And yeah, I'm personally terrified trying it because I feel like it would be a neurological explosion. I don't know. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to experience that. Thank you. We have a question online as well, uh, again on Zoom. Uh, is a strong sense of things or concepts being left or right, or even or uneven, as in numbers, also a form of synesthesia, or is that something else? A strong sense of things or concepts being left or right, or uneven or uneven. So I think that would... Um fall under the term of simple concept shape synesthesia, which we also spoke about on the podcast. So there is a more complex form where uh, concepts like a whole um, thought or a, th a problem solving would um, be assigned with uh, dynamic shapes and forms, but there's also a more less complicated form that a lot of people have that yeah deals with such things like left and right what was it again left and right and even or uneven like numbers and they would be associated with did it say that the a strong sense of things or numbers being left or right or uneven or even or uneven mm. as in numbers okay i see okay so the number Sorry? A concept being left or right, or uh, numbers being even or uneven. So just feeling like, uh, I'm, I think if I understand correctly, <laughs> just assigning assigning things. Just under okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the person that uh, sent this question might want to look into concept shape synesthesia uh, there is a website called the synesthesia tree which a lot of people find very helpful because it lists a ton of different recognized forms um, there are over 60 sometimes it says even over 80 different combinations and forms of synesthesia um, associating concepts with something or processing them slightly different uh, has a lot of different names like high production synesthesia, concept shape, uh, thought process synesthesia. So yeah, I think my recommendation would to look into uh, into that, even if there isn't that much out there. Yeah. If uh, the person online wants to, or they have followed up, uh, as in. Uh, Examples. Oh, wonderful. Monday and Thursday are uneven. Wednesday yeah. and Friday 
even, Saturday also even, Sunday uneven, and Tuesday doesn't fit in anywhere. Yeah, like I, I, yeah, I, I'm 100% sure that a lot of synesthetes can relate to that, even if they would maybe have a different combination. But I think uh, I heard that before, definitely, that things are have a different trait, um, like an additional trait added to it. Uh, so yeah, definitely. I think that would fall under the umbrella of synesthesia. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you for the great talk, Micah. Um, so one question, so this last question make, makes me think uh, that maybe you, because you have synesthesia, it is easier for you to recognize synesthesia in other people. So what, what advice would you give to um, a medical professional without synesthesia when they're, you know, a patient comes to them and they have to maybe recognize a new type of synesthesia that has not been documented? Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting question. Thank you. Um, so I think it will need a completely new, like, chapter uh, talk about what I would want doctors and medical professionals to know about synesthesia, but I think that's a very good way to, to open that conversation. I think being aware that it is a uh, connection of an inducer and a concurrent, so you, you said it would be a completely new form. I would imagine that if it is a completely new form, not just to the doctor, but a new form, they might already know stuff about synesthesia. Is that what you're uh, implying? So the doctor knows about synesthesia and in a new form pops up. Okay, they might not know anything. Okay. Um, what would be my advice? No, I think it is a really good question, but I think it all starts with hearing it out, respecting it, listening to it. Um, maybe if you want to uh, test the patient on it, you can, uh, if, if you have a follow-up appointment, have a consistency test and ask them a couple of things uh, that you asked them at the first appointment as well. And like consistency is still uh, the most important uh, variable to understand if it is synesthesia or just like imagination or uh, good good memory as well. So um, yeah, con testing consistency, understanding that it combines two things that are usually not connected, uh, going online if you, but really just respecting what someone describes and uh, asking questions, listening and following up on it and maybe doing research together and, and finding out if that uh, anything that is written online might resonate with, with their patient. And then um, you can also reach out to synesthesia associations and the synesthesia tree as well, where they would add um, forms. The more people send in that this is what they experience, it might end up on the list and then it will help again, other people that uh, stumble across that later. Um, so that's kind of what I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, conscious of time, we've got one more question uh, on Zoom. Uh, the, uh, Lauren uh, Alyssa Beerley uh, says, Hi, Micah. Thanks for your presentation. It's Hi, special. <laughs> You're welcome. Is spatial sequence synesthesia a form of concept synesthesia? And are synesthetes more prone to concept versus sensory synesthesia as polysynesthetes? Now, do you want me to repeat that or <laughs> break those into the two questions? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic question that I do not have the abil ability to comprehend at this moment. Please read it again. Is spatial sequence synesthesia yeah. a form of concept synesthesia? Is that the first question? Yeah. Can we stop here? <laughs> uh, I've never seen them being like, I, I don't think so, but it would make sense. And I think 
also like the synesthesia tree as much as I like it, I think we could also on that website where a lot of people look uh, things up, have categories, like it makes sense having concept shape as maybe more of a, a headline for a category, definitely. From what I know, from what I've read so far, um, sequence-based synesthesia is a form that hasn't been researched much, but that's one thing, um, because like grapheme color synesthesia is is just researched the most because it's uh, easiest to research. So I think there isn't that much uh, research on sequence-based synesthesia yet. If it is a concept shape uh, form synesthesia, I, yeah, like I said, it not from what I've read. Uh, but I, I get it. I get the comment. It could could be. Thank you. And are synesthetes more prone to concept versus sensory synesthesias as polysynesthetes? I wouldn't say so. But I probably would need a bit more more context on that. Um I think any combination out there. <laughs> well, so if Lauren wants to add another comment, we'll maybe pass that on. Yeah. I.e. Okay. Do you have all concept or all sensory synesthesia? I'm pretty sure that this is uh, not being looked at. Might be a very good research question. I like that. Uh, from my own experience, uh, no. Like, I have both strongly and uh, various forms from both, let's say, categories. So uh, personally, I would say for me, th there is no, uh, not, not two categories, I guess, but, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if that would be a new paper that suggests that if you have concept synesthesia, your other forms might also be in the area of like concept uh, forms. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> also, Thank my you. clients, I would say, also have mixed forms uh, from both suggested categories. So it's not an observation I made so far. Yeah, sure. Um, just kind of following on from that, um, have you heard of idea aesthesia? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what, I don't know if that was what the person asking the question was getting yeah. at, but obviously that's like concept to concept as opposed to sensory to sensory oh so, that is what we're i don't know but that, that okay was well that is a really good <laughs> comment thank you so much no that that's true yeah that that uh wasn't where my mind was going right now but yeah. concept to concept is yeah I that's another that was maybe what the original yeah um, person has the might be might be yeah. yeah definitely thank you i i just have uh, one comment uh, uh, observation I'd like to add uh, and then I'll pass it to uh, Claire to wrap up um, <laughs> the, because of this event um, and I brought it up and spoken with another group saying that this was going this was happening and maybe they'd uh, like to come along or join online uh, one of these people said oh I have that mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and otherwise we'd have never known probably possibly never known that they were a new person uh, and uh, it uh, they uh, told us uh, what colors uh, we each were to them uh, and uh, mine wasn't as good a color as uh, others I can't quite remember it wasn't <laughs> used, but it was uh, it was certainly a really fascinating conversation that we all had uh, and um, so thank you for uh, joining us, coming here, uh, talking about this, uh, and hopefully it increases the visibility and understanding of synesthesia. Uh, so yeah, hopefully. Thank well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much. And before I get to wrap up.
Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that from the 16th of November onwards to the 16th of December, it is Disability Awareness Month. So, which means we can be visible for one month and then we have to be ninjas again. And um, we will do our best to do something from the Disabled Staff Network um, during that month to increase visibility. Um, and in the meantime, if anyone wants to join the Disabled Staff Network, you'll find us um, under dsn at ed.ac.uk and um, you can join our team. And if you're looking to invite someone to your department who can teach you about neurodiversity, about inclusion in general, about communication in a cultural and um, neurodiverse environment, you can also email us and we'll organize someone to come to your department or your service group and talk to you and hopefully make the workplace even more awesome. So, thank you very much again. That was a very interesting talk and that is us. Thank you.